I wanted to um, show that Explore God video this morning for two reasons. One, obviously, the subject matter is relevant to what we've been talking about the last couple weeks as it relates to prayer and our understanding of prayer. And I, I think for um, a lot of us, we can resonate with some of the ideas that, that are there, especially some of the uh, questioning or the sense of formality or how do I do this and but I also wanted you to see just the level of quality that, that this Explore God material is producing. Because if you're like me, um, if I'm going to get a group of friends together and we're going to meet in my living room and we're going to talk about questions around, does God have a purpose for my life and does he exist and can I trust the Bible and these sorts of things, I, I, I want that to be good. I want that to be solid, right? And I wanted you to be able to see that what they produce and what will help generate these conversations with our friends are really well done, and that we can have, that we can have confidence in that. And so we're excited for January and February and, and when Explore God comes around, and we look forward to seeing how God's going to use that and the stories that are going to fo- unfold as a result of that. I also wanted to um, just sort of recognize we're, we're coming to the conclusion now of our With Jesus series. We've been started all the way back in September, and we've been talking about what does life look like with Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus? In the last three weeks, we've been talking about what does it mean to do life with Jesus in prayer, to meet with him in this conversational way. And we've been talking about Jesus' prayer life, and we've been talking about what Jesus taught us on how not to pray. And this morning, we are going to, um, to look at how Jesus taught us to pray. But as as we wrap up this With Jesus series, which the timing is perfect because we've spent the fall looking at what is life with Jesus. We're going to usher into Advent where we recognize and celebrate that Jesus, God, came to be Emmanuel, came to be with us, right? So we're going to continue in this same theme. But really, my heart's desire is that this is not something that we move on from. That, That we continue to ask ourselves and to wrestle with, okay, what is what does it mean for us as the church to do life with Jesus? What does this look like for us to follow him and to be his apprentice, to, to commit our lives to his kingdom purposes? Um, and I pray and I hope that this is something that we continue to, to talk about and think about as, as we uh, move forward um, this year. When you personally think of prayer, what do you think of? Like what, what comes to mind for you? Or let me ask it differently. What do you desire or hope to accomplish as a result of praying? What what is it that you hope that produces for you? Um, What would you say when you pray that you want from God? I uh, I recently, a couple weeks ago, when we started this series, I, I was teaching on Saturday night here, and I ran off following the service to a family birthday party, and we had some extended family there and so they asked what what we were talking about at at the service or what I taught on and I told them how we were talking about the prayer life of Jesus and how he would escape to pray and they said oh that's funny and just we had a funny prayer story just the other day because they have their daughter Kate I think she's about three maybe four years old just sweet adorable girl it's kind of like in-law of my in-law sort of thing so um, and, and they said she came down the stairs the other day and, and uh, walked into the living room, and her dad was kind of spread out on the couch resting, and goes, hey, Dad, get off the couch. And they kind of paused and said, Kate, like, that's, not, that's not how you ask. And she said, but I want Dad off the couch. And, and she said, well, what, her mom said to her, well, what do you think if you were on the couch and somebody just came down and said, hey, Kate, get off the couch? How would you feel? Like, what would that, and they said, well, that would be mean. That would, I wouldn't like that. And she said, well, do you see then how that's, that's mean to kind of talk to your dad that way? She said, yeah, it's hard. I just, I want the couch. And, and they said, well, okay, well, this is the, recognizing the teachable moments like good parents. This is, let's talk about what it means to share or what it means to ask somebody to do something politely. And she said, yeah, that's just really hard to do. And her parents said, yes, you're right. Sometimes that is hard to do. But they, again, seeing the teachable moment, they said, but that's sometimes we just have to ask God to give us the strength or to help us understand or to give us the courage. And this seemed to be able to, to resonate. And they said, that's great that you can just, you can pray to God and you can ask him and he'll help you. And, and so she kind of 
sort of nods and like she's getting it and 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 kind of walks off into the kitchen and her mom just sort of overhears her starting to pray and she goes dear jesus can you tell daddy to get off the couch <laughs> and and uh and her dad goes you know what's funny is somehow i ended up off the couch uh, See, we, can, we, we hear that story. We, we even can admire the honesty of, of, a, of a child who, who is processing all of this and says, well, this is what I want, and I get, I've been told I can go to God and ask. And, but but we also, there's also this degree of familiarity in that for us, right? There's this sense of understanding because our prayers can oftentimes perhaps more eloquently or perhaps not as directly very much reflect that same sort of idea. God, can you just do this for me? In fact, I can recognize in my own prayer life, it can start with a moment or two of thankfulness and maybe kind of add in a phrase or two of, of praise or adoration, but I pretty quickly get to my wish list. I, I pretty quickly can get to the things that I want God to, to do. And oftentimes I think I'm asking for the right things. I'm, I'm asking that, that people that I care about who are sick might receive healing. I'm, I'm asking for people in need to have their needs met. I'm asking for protection and for, for um, God's oversight of people I love and care about. I'm asking for, for all good things. I might slip in like a thing or two that, that I need or want in there as well. And I'm not suggesting that God doesn't want us to, to come to him with our needs and our wants. In fact, if you look at, at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, right? It's, it's explicit. Peter's explicit in his instruction here. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So he, he instructs us to bring our, our worries and our concerns and, and our heaviness and to be able to bring that to God. However, when Jesus teaches us to pray, the model that he provides for us is a model that focuses first on surrender and on celebration. It's rather than, than just this presentation of a wish list. My wife, um, when we started this focus on prayer a couple weeks ago, was reminded of a, a devotional that I had given her last Christmas it's a book by Paul David Tripp called New Morning Mercies. And they're just, each day is just a short reading, but it's meant to just kind of focus your mind in an area. It's really good. I'd recommend it um, if you're looking for a gift for somebody this year. But in this uh, particular devotion, Tripp writes, he says, true prayer happens at the intersection of surrender and celebration. Prayer is profoundly more than handing a wish list to God and letting him know you're thankful that he exists and has the power to deliver. This kind of prayer puts you at the center in a very real way, reduces God to the divine waiter. It's not him that you want. It's not his wisdom that you see yourself needing. It's not his grace that your heart craves. Wish list prayer essentially says, I know what's best for my life, and I'd appreciate it, God, if you would use your might to make it happen. So I think Tripp's words there, for me, really resonated with my my oftentimes too frequent approach to, to prayer and to God. But when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to do far more than, than bring a wish list. Because he's teaching us to pray about things that are far greater, far bigger than, than our immediate need. Last week when Pastor Brian was with us, he, we taught on these same verses from Matthew chapter 6 that we're going to look on today, and we looked at Jesus teaching us to pray, and last week Pastor Brian focused on the beginning section of these verses, how Jesus in fact teaches us not to pray, and he talked about how it, it's not uh, a magical, it's, it's not a, um, a, a transactional encounter, and it's not a, a performance, right? He, he, Jesus explicitly says he uses the illustration of the Pharisee, and he teaches us what prayer isn't. But after that, he follows up, and he's teaching his disciples, and he says, this then is how you should pray. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 6 and look at this together. We're going to pick things up in verse 9 and, and uh, read through verse 13. And many of you will recognize. 
It says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I think it's, it's worth noting for us here. Many of you, if you grew up in the church, if you grew up around the church, this passage is not only familiar to you, but it may be something that you have recited or memorized from early childhood. Even if, even our culture, just in general, if you didn't grow up in around the church, many people are familiar with the Lord's Prayer. Um, we, we have heard it at weddings and at funerals, and it, it's a part of our upbringing in many ways. And that is a good thing, but at the same time, there's a caution there. At least I can tell you in my own experience, I think I first memorized the Lord's Prayer and learned to recite the Lord's Prayer before I ever stopped to think about what the Lord was teaching us about prayer and, and why he taught us to pray this way. Jesus does things so intentionally and purposefully. And so this section here of Jesus' teaching is right in the middle of this larger section of teaching that Jesus, or that, that we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. And we've been talking about this. Jesus has been showing us, demonstrating, teaching his disciples what what life looks like in his kingdom. And so as Jesus now teaches his disciples to pray, he, he has this kingdom perspective, this kingdom vision in mind as he, as he shows them this. So when you think about the Lord's Prayer, think of the Lord's Prayer as his kingdom prayer. So for you and I, if you are a follower of, of Jesus who've been called to live according to his kingdom to his kingdom values and his kingdom priorities and, and beyond that we've been called to be instruments of his of these same kingdom values and these same kingdom priorities in the world around us in light of all of that that Jesus has been teaching and emphasizing he says this then is how you should pray and I want us to look at, at three sections of the Lord's prayer really, really the, the who the what and the how the who the what and the how so let's begin with the who. Uh, verse 9. I just realized I just said let's begin with the who. Like, uh, the, never mind. Verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So as Jesus teaches us to pray, he begins by reminding us who we are praying to. I, I've told you guys before, I grew up in a house full of all boys and and. Uh, I have two brothers and my dad, and one of our primary forms of love language was like physical violence, right? And so we would, we, it just, there was always wrestling going on. My mom would just roll her eyes because sometimes it would happen in public places and it was embarrassing for her. And my dad would join into the, the chaos. He would, he would get in the mix of it. He loved to get on the floor and wrestle with his boys. And as we got older and we got stronger, we began to be able to kind of, uh, hold our own a little bit, you know, or maybe even get perhaps a little too big for our britches. But my dad had this, this signature move that, that whenever we started to kind of push a little too hard, he had like this ability, like a ninja-like reflex to grab like a pressure point on our shoulder and render us like completely helpless. And like this is my, this was my dad's way, no matter how big we got, no matter how strong we got, of, of saying to us, don't forget I'm still dad. Like don't forget who you're talking to. Don't forget who you're wrestling with. We have made a point of emphasis over the last several weeks, couple weeks, talking about the relational nature of prayer. In fact, we, we define prayer as a relational conversation with God. You saw that echoed in in the video this morning. We talked about talking about what matters most with the one who matters most. And this, this relational understanding of prayer, it's exemplified and modeled to us by Jesus' own prayer life. However, I think it's equally important that we understand that this relational prayer is not, it's not amongst equals. In fact, I, I think this is what makes it so extraordinary. 
that, that, that God, who, who is so much greater, so much bigger, invites us into conversation with him. So when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to begin by acknowledging who it is that we pray to. So when we say these words, when, when, when we begin by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, we are confessing, we're acknowledging that he's God and we're not. And that's where we start from. See, that term hallowed is, is not one that we use a lot in our uh, circumstances and surroundings. But it means sanctifying. It means that work of God that he does in our hearts and our lives to, to transform us, that work of God that makes you and I to be men and women who are becoming increasingly formed in the image of Jesus. It, it is the unique work of God in our lives. So when we, when we acknowledge, when we recognize, when we confess him as hallowed, when we say that's his name, we're inviting his sanctifying work into our lives. This is why I think when, when Tripp writes about prayer and he talks about it being that intersection of celebration and surrender, this is what I think he's referring to. See, when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to begin at the point of surrender. Tripp goes on to write, he says, In true prayer, you surrender your claim on your life to the greater and wiser plans and purposes of God. You submit your will to his. It's not God signing your list. It's you surrendering your life to him. Now, I can't tell you how many times I have prayed, recited these first two lines of the Lord's Prayer and just kind of gone right past them without pausing or thinking for a moment, grasping the significance of what Jesus is teaching us to pray here. See, these aren't, this isn't merely titles. It's far more. This is, Jesus is teaching this as this overt and this intentional recognition, this, this actively beginning our prayers at the point of surrender. And I'll tell you this, this is, this is far easier to say than to mean. It, 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 uh, like at that heart level. Like this is far easier for me to sort of rotely kind of blow right past than it is to to acknowledge God for who he is in, in doing that, recognize that, that I'm not God, and to come to him from a position of surrender. So when we begin prayer at the, with the, the, the understanding of who we're praying to, we are acknowledging his claim in our lives. We're acknowledging that, that our role and our activity, our participation in his kingdom plan begins at the point of surrender. And so we pray and we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed, sanctifying is your name. And we begin with surrender. And then Jesus moves on to teach us kind of the what of prayer. What, what, is, it that we're, what is it that we're praying for? Look at what Jesus teaches us next in verse 10. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So now Jesus is, is directing specifically these kingdom purposes that God has for us. Um, I, I've told you the story again before of, of my dad and his battle with cancer and all the things that we learned in life as a result of that. And I remember one of the things that actually kind of frustrated me at the time when we would gather together as a family to pray or, or, or stories my mom would tell about my dad's personal prayer life, I, I prayed what I wanted. I prayed that my dad would be healed, that the cancer would be gone, it would be removed, and, and, and that he would be fully restored, and, and I, that's what I prayed for. And my dad prayed for the same thing. He, he wanted that as well, but he had this, this habit of adding on to the end of that prayer, he would say something like, God, if you're, but if you're going to do something in this, if you have some, some way that you're going to use this to draw people to you and to, to show others how great you are, and, and I, would, I would literally, in my mind, think like, stop doing that. Like, end at that first part where we got to be like-minded here. we got to be singularly focused. Stop adding that last thing, because I don't want that. That's not what I want, but that's what he wanted. 
And so he would, he would add that phrase, God, if you're, if you're doing something here, if you're going to, and I kept saying, well, the thing he's going to do is like, think how awesome it's going to be when you're fully healed. And we're going to be able to look at that and say, look, God healed my dad, and this is awesome. But that's not how he prayed, because he understood a bigger purpose. He understood a kingdom purpose. If there's something you're doing to draw people to you in all of this, then I'm in. And I struggled. I struggled to pray that with him. But this is what Jesus is teaching us here. And I think it's, it's worth noting, I think order is important here. I think how we approach this. Because we're never really fully able to pray God's kingdom come, his will be done if I first haven't come to the point of surrender. That, that's kind of what I was praying, I think. So sometimes I, I, when I start to pray this, I have to go back to our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I have to stay there for a while to recognize if I'm just saying that or if I'm meaning that, if my heart is there. It's out of surrender that, that we can now engage kingdom purposes that Jesus teaches us to pray for. And this is essential in our understanding of, of what God is doing in the here and now. So I think, I'll speak for myself, I sometimes make the mistake of, of thinking of this as, as a future thing. That earth is the here and the now. This is what we exist. This is our experience. And, and heaven is this future thing when we're taken out of this world. But this isn't how Jesus prays. He says, he teaches us to pray. He says, God's kingdom, his will would not only be a, a future reality, but it would increasingly be the, the present reality. See, what what God teaches us to pray for is his restorative work. We Genesis 1 and 2, right? We get this picture of, of humankind living in perfect communion with God. It's, it's unhindered and it's beautiful. But then humanity decided that they knew how to do things better. And so sin enters the picture. And all of this picture of harmony and of community and of relationship and, and proximity and presence, it's all blown up. And now where there was once harmony and community, there's brokenness and there's hiding and shame and isolation. There's distance between us and God. And from that moment forward, there have been kingdoms in conflict. There's the kingdom of God, how God designed and intended the experience in Genesis 1, 20, uh, 1 and 2 where they're together in harmony. And then there's the kingdom of this world that has been the result of, of sin on all of that. And it's not this is now and this is future. Jesus says, I have come to, to enter in, to usher in a new kingdom, to bring it back. This is his restorative work. So when he arrives on earth, as we will celebrate, he says, I have come to restore what's been lost. I've come to bring you back into right relationship with the Father. And, and as followers of Jesus, as his disciples, that's not only been our experience, but he also says then that, that, that I will use you to accomplish that work in the world around us. This is his, his prayer for our purpose. See, Jesus doesn't just hold on for a, a future day. He, he doesn't teach the church to kind of bunker down and escape the fray and, and protect ourselves. That's not his vision for why he's placed us here. See, that isn't what he taught us to pray. We've been taught to pray for God's kingdom to come here and now, to take over more and more of this world and to increasingly take over more and more of my life, that I would be, that you and I would be increasingly oriented to the Father and to his purpose here. We've, I've seen photos of um, the, just the horrific wildfires out in, in California. And one of the photos that always sort of stirs in me is when you see just these cars lined up trying to escape, right? Trying to get out of the devastation and the destruction and get away from it. And then you'll see just kind of on the opposite side of the road, like a, a, a fire engine or an ambulance or some sort of first responder that's going into the chaos. And, and I think what Jesus is instructing the church here is, I know, I, you are 
spiritual first responders. That, that we don't run from the devastation, we don't run from the destruction, we don't run, we increasingly are, are called to push back on the kingdom of this world and to usher in the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom. Again, to quote Tripp on this point, and, th- and this is why I think he refers to prayer as celebration. He says this, he says, you find joy in the reality that he's chosen to give you his kingdom. You're blown away by the fact that he, he unleashes his almighty power to meet your needs. You celebrate forgiving, rescuing, transforming, enabling, and delivering grace. You find joy in your inclusion in his work of redemption. See, Jesus teaches us to pray for, for his kingdom because that's what he's put us here to do. The church has a job to do. You have a job to do. He's put us here to, to not only experience it, but to invite others into his restorative work. And so as he concludes his prayer, he, he teaches us a little bit about the how. How, how do we do this? How, how do we live this out? What what does this look like? Um, when I was at first at, at Chapel Street um, 12 years ago, the student ministry for years has been taking trips to Ecuador. You've heard me talk about it, but I had never been there before. And, and um, Ecuador and the Quito particularly, it's, it's a little bit of a, a unique place in the sense that it's right on the equator. Like literally the camp that we stay on is, is right on the equator. And so, in the daytime, the sun is intense. I mean, really intense. You can burn quickly, you're exhausted, you're dehydrated, all these sorts of things. But at the same time, it's at a very high elevation. You're at like nine to 11,000 feet generally up there. And so in the evening time, when the sun goes down, it, it drops to 40 degrees. And so I had heard people say like, oh, it cools down at night, which in my mind translated to like long t-shirt kind of wear, right? Like, and so I prepared for like it to be like 100 degrees and burning hot all the time there. And then like the first evening when we're going out to the campfire to have, have our, our team time and our devotional time, like I see all these people who had been there before, like grabbing gloves and a hat and sweatshirts and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, huh, I was freezing that whole week, right? Because I was unprepared. Because I didn't talk to somebody who'd been there before. You see, this last section of Jesus' prayer here, this is is Jesus for us, in in my understanding of it, this is Jesus in his humanity saying, okay, I know what they're going to need. I know what they're going to need to ask for. And so he teaches us to ask for it. If you look back in, in the last three verses here, 11, 12, and 13, is Jesus teaches us what to ask for. He teaches us three things. He says, ask for bread, for forgiveness, and for deliverance. He says, give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we also have, uh, have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's, let's look at these real, quick, uh, real quickly here. First, when Jesus teaches about the bread, Jesus does this so often, but he'll often he, he will allude to a portion of an experience in their history to help them understand what he's teaching them in the moment. And like that, Jesus, if you think back to the, the, the story of the Hebrew people of Israel, when they had left Egypt and they were on their way to the promised land, they were in between two kingdoms, right? And they found themselves in the wilderness and they were completely dependent. And how did God provide for them? They would wake up every day. And the ground would be covered with bread, with manna. And they would go out and they would collect that and, and, and they would have their supply, what they needed to exist for the day. See, this is the mindset that Jesus wants us to pray with. And we struggle with this. In a culture of affluence, we struggle with this. But it's not about how much we have. It's about an attitude and a mindset about understanding what we have and what we don't have. See, Jesus is teaching us to pray when he teaches us to pray for our daily bread. Pray a prayer of dependence on my ability to provide what you need. Come to me in daily dependence 
for, for what it is that you're going to need today. And when you see me provide it for you, when, when you see me give that to you, then respond in, in gratitude and in celebration as I meet your needs. So he's giving us, despite what we have or what we don't have, what he wants as an attitude, a mindset about how we approach things. Remember even in, in Acts, when, when the disciples are first building the church, right? They look at all their stuff and, and they say, you know what, this is, this is, this is community. Like if somebody else needs something, it's, it's, it's theirs. We will depend on God for what we need for today, but everything else is, is up for grabs. Um, that's how they envisioned things happening in the church. That was their attitude towards, attitude towards the thing they have. That was praying for their daily bread. By the way, th this prayer here, this is a prayer that when we pray that at a heart level, it inspires generosity in us. He goes on there and he, and he talks about praying for forgiveness to, to both be forgiven, but also the ability to forgive others, which Jesus talks a lot about in the Gospel of Matthew, but is also, it, it makes perfect sense that Jesus would talk about this in his kingdom prayer, because in his kingdom, one of the highest values, one of the central ethics is forgiveness. It, it, forgiveness is what has enabled us to enter into his kingdom, and so Jesus is saying, as a people who understand who've been forgiven, let forgiveness spill out. Let, 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 that, let the world understand and experience what it means to be forgiven from people who know it personally. Show them this kingdom ethic. Show them how it's different in my kingdom than in the kingdom of this world. So release your right to give even. And, and, and let that go and model this to the people around you, to the world around you. And then lastly, he teaches us to pray for deliverance. See, if, if, if we are praying this prayer, if we're living this prayer, then we should expect opposition. And again, I think this is Jesus saying, I've been here. I, I, if you think back to when Jesus was tested and he's drawn out into the desert to, for 40 days to be, to be tested by Satan, and if you look at that, what, what Satan brings to him there in order to tempt and to distract him, right? What is it that Satan tempts him with, tests him with? It's an exchange of kingdoms. It, he's saying, I, look at the world. Look at everything. I will give you all of this. You will have rule and reign if you just abandon your mission from God. And Jesus refuses him at every turn. But Jesus understands. He knows if you're about this, if this is what you want... If this is your experience, if this is how you're living, if you're praying this and you're living this, then you should expect it. And when it comes, say, pray, God, give me the deliverance to not exchange your kingdom and your values and your priorities for something lesser. He says, pray for deliverance. See, the, the Lord's Prayer, when we think about it, why does, why does Jesus teach us to pray this way? What, what is he giving us? See, this is, this is a condensed version of his kingdom ethic and values. This is, you know, like if you, you work in a corporation or a company, how they'll, how they'll put up somewhere in, in space that their employees will see it, their vision, right? They're, this is what we exist to do. We want to keep this in. They have manuals and manuals all over the place about how things are supposed to get done, strategies, employee. That's, that's all there, but they will keep a phrase or two in front of you that reminds you of that vision. See, Jesus gives us this, the Lord's Prayer. He gives us his kingdom prayer so that every day we can start our life by saying, okay, God, remind me again that I, I need to surrender to you. Remind me of your kingdom purposes here and allow me to, to live that out as I seek from you your daily provision, as I discover forgiveness in you and, and offer it to others. And Lord, deliver me. Deliver me from the tests and the temptation that come because I don't want to exchange this greater kingdom for a lesser one. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And as we conclude this morning, we're going to conclude by, by hearing again through song um, the Lord's Prayer. And, and my, as we use this time, I want to encourage you to, to just pray that kingdom prayer. 
to, to pray that prayer of surrender, to pray that prayer of purpose, and to God, ask God to give you the things you need to be able to do it. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for this time and looking at your, the way you taught us to pray. Because you have given us a job to do. You've given us a purpose to uphold. And God, we want to be about your business. So focus us again as your church on your kingdom and expanding that here as we push back on the kingdom of this world and we invite people in. Remind us of who you are. Lord, allow us to celebrate the fact that you include us in your work and give us what we need to be able to do it. It's in your name we pray.